Hi, I'm Tamara Broderick. Today I'm going to talk about trusting data analyses. In particular, I'm going to talk about how it's possible for two well-meaning researchers to come to totally opposite conclusions on a data analysis. And we'll talk about ways to try to prevent this disconnect. Today I'm mostly going to be reviewing other people's super cool work, but I'll talk a little bit at the end about our own research. And both the review and the new research were assembled with a set of fantastic collaborators who I'm very lucky to work with. Okay, so as I said, today's talk is about trusting decisions from data. And I think the exciting thing about the past few decades is that we've increasingly gotten so much more data and so much better computation. And so we really have this opportunity for data analyses to drive our life-changing decisions. These could be decisions in personal finance. It could be decisions in medical care. It could be decisions in education. The point is there's a lot of decisions we really care about. And we really care about making sure that really we know what's going on, that really these decisions are helping people. And so probably we should be running tons of checks on these decisions. Today, we're gonna talk about a lot of those checks. And really our talk and those checks are gonna be motivated by the following observation. So a typical setup in a data analysis has two steps. First, I run my data analysis on an available set of data and I reach a decision. But the point of that decision is really, really often gonna be, I wanna apply that to new data in the future. So just as a concrete example, economists are really interested in microcredit, these small loans to individuals in impoverished areas, and they wanna know is microcredit helping people? And so an economist who might go out into the world, they might run some kind of trial on a bunch of people, try to decide is microcredit helping people, and if they conclude that it does help, go and distribute it to more people in more places in the future. Now, when we go to step one to step two, from step one to step two, we're typically doing something we call generalization. We're generalizing from the conclusions on a particular set of data at a particular time to make much more general conclusions for a whole population. And we might worry about that generalization step if it turns out we could have actually come to different conclusions and different analyses in step one, if so-called replicability failed. And unfortunately, there's reason to believe that this can happen. So for instance, a cool set of researchers looked at 100 major psychology experiments. They tried to rerun those experiments, see if they could get the same conclusions, but less than half had the same result as the original conclusions. Another cool set of researchers looked at hematology oncology papers. In this case, they reran the results from, or the experiments from 53 papers. And in this case, just six had the same result. And there are lots of other examples of this. But the point is, it looks like we could run two different data analyses in step one. We could come to different conclusions. And so it's not clear what single conclusion we would apply to a bunch of data in the future. And so we'd like to review this. We'd like to understand this. How could generalization fail? Now, of course, generalization can fail if you totally make up your data or if some adversary comes in and they change your data. But here we're going to assume that these aren't the case. There are other people studying those cases. They're super interesting. But today we're gonna to assume that everyone is well-meaning, they're using vetted tools, there's no adversary, and yet we're gonna see that it's still possible for researchers to come up with different conclusions. So we'll talk about potential mitigations as well. Now at the very end, we'll spend just a little time talking about a check that we propose in our own research for stability to try to understand if generalization might break down. So everything we do before this will just be review, lots of cool people's cool research, that'll be um, our own research. But just like all of the checks we'll talk about today, it won't be a silver bullet. Nothing's a cure-all, we really have to be thoughtful about our data analyses. Okay, so in the rest of the talk today, we're gonna start by going through just a concrete example of a data analysis to get us all on the same page. We're gonna use that to see that there are often four sort of steps in a data analysis. First, you've gotta collect your data. Then you've gotta turn your real life problem into a mathematical problem. Typically, you're gonna to have to run an algorithm to solve that math problem. And that algorithm is going to exist in code. And so we're gonna see 
challenges at every one of these steps and potential mitigations to help us get generalizable data science conclusions. Uh, and then finally, as I said at the end, we'll talk about a stability check. The check is exactly going to be, can I drop a super tiny fraction of my data and change my conclusions? And then I might worry about generalization. We'll talk a lot more about how we get to this point throughout the talk, but just to whet your appetite, we're going to see that in an existing real life study of an economic intervention, we can actually drop one data point out of over 16,500 and change the conclusions, change the conclusions between the economic intervention helping and hurting. And we're going to see that this check isn't the same as a lot of other standard checks, like checking for outliers, uh, checking for a small p value, and so on. And we'll talk about those checks along the way. OK, so let's dive in to our example analysis uh, of microcredit, although the lessons we'll learn will certainly not be specific to that. OK, so in any real life analysis, we have to start with a real world goal. What are we trying to learn? And so in the case of an economic intervention like microcredit um, or a medical intervention or a public health intervention, we typically want to know, is it helping people? And just an immediate challenge that we face is, well, what does that actually mean? What are we actually going to measure? So in the case of microcredit, and trying to decide what to measure, economists often look at one of a couple of things. One is they might look at business profit. They might measure here, these people didn't receive microcredit, what's their business profit? These people did receive microcredit, what's their business profit? Did microcredit increase business profit? Uh, they also will often look at things like calorie consumption. So these people didn't receive microcredit, what's their calorie consumption? These people did receive microcredit, what's their calorie consumption? And compare those values. Now, another tough question that arises almost immediately is who's going to get measured? So typically, um, it is difficult to find people to measure, to, to work with large sets of people, and so, for instance, an economist might partner with a local organization that works with a bunch of people. Um, somebody who's looking at a medical intervention might partner with a hospital. So that narrows it down to a particular set of people and a particular location and a particular time. Often people will only look at a subset, even so. They might look at people in a particular age range. They might not look at people who have particular health issues. And so in the end, we have a particular subset of people who are getting measured. And that can also be changed further by how the data is collected. So when dealing with people, there has to be some way to actually get this data out in the end. Often that'll be in the form of a survey. So if you have an in-person survey, you might go up to somebody's household, but what if they're away? What if they move? That person might now not be a part of this analysis. Um, if you collect connect people on phone, that might be more convenient for many people. On the other hand, some people might not have phones or might not answer. Same thing with mail and so on. We also have to think about how to distribute the intervention. So if it turned out that, you know, even if microcredit had absolutely no effect, we could have a bunch of people over here who just happen to already have higher business profits, a bunch of people here who have lower business profits. And now, you know, maybe what we do is we give microcredit only to the people with higher business profits, and we don't give microcredit to the people with lower business profits. And again, even if microcredit has no effect, you can imagine a situation now where we average the business profits in the two groups, and it just looks like microcredit's helping just because we only gave it to the people with higher business profits. And so to ignore, to, uh, to avoid this kind of bias, people will use a randomized controlled trial that randomly decide that each person receives microcredit or doesn't receive microcredit, but there's still tons of challenging issues. What's the level of randomization? Is it that the individual receives microcredit or not? Well, what if the individual receiving microcredit influences the people around them? Is it that a community receives microcredit or not? Well, then what's a community? Is it a village? What if I'm in an urban area? These are just really tough questions that data analysts have to deal with. Once we decide, on exactly what to measure and who to measure, there's still this really tough question about how to make a decision from this data. Just because we said we wanted microcredit to increase business profit doesn't mean we're done. We have to actually choose a mathematical way to instantiate that. One really simple option is to compare the empirical mean of people who received microcredit 
to the empirical mean of people who did not receive microcredit, the business profit, the empirical mean of the business profit of these people, to the empirical mean of business profit of these people. And we might look for a statistically significant positive effect. This is very common. Um, but there are tons of other options. We could have compared the median. We could have compared some other amount. And that could really matter, as we're going to see. Now, at the end of step two, sometimes we've done something more complex. Maybe we actually had a bunch of other information about the people receiving microcredit. And so we decided to use a linear model, sort of a generalization of this direct comparison of means. If we use a linear model, we have to find some way to fit it. So maybe we use something like ordinary least squares. We might decide to use a Bayesian method. So Bayesian methods have been used in a lot of the big scientific discoveries of the past few decades, things like uh, discovering the TRAPPIST-1 exoplanets or discovering gravitational waves, confirming gravitational waves, um, things like that. And then we have to decide a way to approximate that, maybe with something like Markov Chan Monte Carlo. AI is increasingly a part of science um, and scientific endeavors. And so we might decide to use something like deep learning, but then we have to decide on the architecture we're going to use, on the optimization method we're going to use. There are a lot of decisions at the algorithm level, too. And then finally, once we have our algorithm, you know, we have our data, we have how we're going to make our decision, we have our algorithm, we have to choose code. And that'll often be some standard packages, but really it's a full pipeline. So even when we're using standard packages, we as the data analysts will often start by pre-processing our data in some way before we feed it into those packages. And then finally, we post-process our data and choose to make certain plots, choose to report certain summaries, and so on. And that's all part of our code. And so what we're going to do with the remainder of our time is we're going to dig into each of these steps, making the measurements on actual data, turning this mathematically into a decision, choosing an algorithm and choosing code. And we're going to see some challenges that can arise at each step. And we're also going to see some mitigations. So we're going to start with the first step, making measurements on actual data. And then we'll turn around and go from step four up. So we'll go with step one first then step four, three, and finally end on two. So let's dig into measurements on actual data. The real problem here, the, or the, probably the biggest challenge um, at this level is that it's hard to measure what I actually care about. So I'm just always, almost always going to have to be using a proxy. So you know what we really care about when we're looking at something like a medical intervention or an economic intervention is that we want people's lives to be better. You know, maybe we want them to live longer lives. We want to know, is the intervention increasing their longevity? Really, we want their quality of life to be higher. Is the intervention increasing their quality of life? Is it increasing the number of years of a high quality life? And these are just incredibly tough things to actually measure in practice. And so the reality is we just have to use some kind of proxy for that. So for instance, even though we really care about something like quality of life or more life or something like that, in the economics example we saw earlier, people are going to measure something like um, the business profit or the calorie consumption. So it's pretty much impossible to avoid some type of proxy. We hope it'll be a good proxy, but it's worth keeping in mind that there are better and worse proxies. And also that we should just know that we're always using a proxy in case that helps us interpret what's going on. So just to illustrate what could go wrong, potentially with a proxy, let's look at a public health concern. So across the world, a public health concern is anemia, that many people aren't getting enough oxygen sent to their body. And this can you know, hurt them health-wise. And so something that's very cool is that a number of countries are actually really interested in improving the, um, the public health of their citizens and so as just one concrete example, Cambodia is aware that a number of its citizens face anemia. And so they're really interested in potential interventions for anemia. And so they've looked at a lot of really interesting things here. Um, scientists have looked at, could we give people iron supplements to help with anemia? And a concern there is yes, the iron supplements might help increase iron, but maybe people aren't really gonna take them. Maybe they're not actually going to use them really regularly. So another idea is to give people pans, um, cast iron pans, that might leak some iron into the food and that might improve their iron status. 
Now, some people notice that in certain populations, people aren't really using cast iron pans. They might not want to use them. And so could you come up with something that is more useful or more acceptable to them in that population? And so another idea that people had was to take this sort of lucky iron fish that's sort of culturally acceptable, put it into a generic pan, and then that can leak iron into an individual's diet. And there's so many, there's a, a bunch of other interventions that people are interested in here. Now, a really natural thing then, and something that, that many people look at, is the amount of iron in the blood. So, you know, you have to measure something. Let's measure the iron in the blood, maybe for people who receive the intervention and people who don't, and then compare them. Now, something to keep in mind when doing this is that it's known that there are multiple potential causes of anemia. One is iron deficiency, but another potential cause is genetic disorders. So you could have a genetic disorder such that even if you have a lot of iron, you're still not able to get that oxygen to your body. And so it's totally possible, and this is indeed a concern in places like Cambodia, that an intervention might increase measures of iron in the blood. It might look really good if that's what we measured, but if the goal ultimately is to reduce anemia, it might actually not be really helping with that problem. And so here's a case where a proxy might not be quite so helpful for what we're doing. Now, another potential thought that some people may have is, well, gosh, you know, I'm running a randomized controlled trial. If I run a randomized controlled trial, and in fact, I'm measuring the exact thing I care about. So, you know, if I care about iron deficiency, I'm measuring iron deficiency. If I care um, really ultimately about um, something like uh, business profit, I'm measuring business profit. Let's say I'm measuring the exact thing I care about. Doesn't that guarantee that any benefit I find will generalize? Well, in fact, there can be additional concerns, not just about the thing we're measuring. And so this is illustrated, for instance, in this cool research on job placement assistance. And so um, a concern for people on the job market and as well for countries is if somebody uh, loses their job for whatever reason, uh, they're often in a position where they would like to get another job as soon as possible. And so an intervention that various countries are interested in is can they provide assistance to individuals to try to place them into jobs as soon as possible. And so people will look at randomized controlled trials of these interventions. These people receive job placement assistance. These people do not. You can ask things like, okay, at eight months, do we find that people are more likely to have jobs if they receive the assistance? Do we find that they are, have a higher income if they, we receive the assistance and so on? And so a couple of issues that can arise is, well, we measured at a particular time. What about other times? And so um, a paper looked at a longer time scale, and they concluded that while there are benefits at eight months, those benefits can be gone by 12 months or 20 months or so on. And in particular, what I mean by that is that there's no difference between the people who received the job placement assistance and the people who who did not receive it. Now, if you're an individual who received the job placement assistance, you might still be quite happy to have benefits at eight months, that would still be nice. But a big concern, for instance, if you are a, a government official thinking about using these ideas, is that, well, maybe it's the case that actually there's just a queue of people looking for jobs and giving people job placement assistance is just moving them elsewhere in this queue, but not ultimately changing overall the benefits or the, you know, the status of all of the people um, in, in your population. And in fact, that seems to be a concern, um, that benefits seem to be at the expense of other workers. And so um, it's based on this study. And so if, in fact, there were a world in which job placement assistance just moved people up in this queue, you would see in a randomized controlled trial that at least for some period of time, the people who receive the assistance are doing better than the people who don't, but overall the population is not doing better. Those people have just been moved around. And so as a government, you would like to you know, look more at interventions that'll actually help lots of people. And in general, there's sort of a related issue that arises a lot of times in economics and medical fields and so on that conclusions from interventions that are on a small scale don't always scale up to larger groups. So for instance, an agricultural example, um, maybe you have some really great new plant food for your crops, um, and maybe because of it, you're able to grow a lot more crops. But if the demand globally is constant for your type of crop, 
then if you grow a lot more, the price is going to drop. And actually you and all of your fellow growers of this crop might not actually be better off. Um, on the other hand, you could have a medical intervention that reduces spread of disease, and it might actually have much larger population impacts than simple extrapolation of individual impacts. So even if we're measuring exactly what we want, we can still have these concerns with randomized controlled trials. In fact, there can be more concerns than even the things I've talked about here. They're a useful tool, but like everything, they're no silver bullet. Okay, so what are the mitigations at this level where we're choosing our, our measurements, we're choosing what to measure? Well, clearly something that's coming to play here is that data science isn't just a sort of cut and dry uh, you know, application of a certain set of principles that can be totally automated. It's super important to have domain experts in here providing context to the ideas. And domain experts could mean a lot of different types of expertise. Um, in the first example here, we might want experts on um, a particular country and the social norms of that country. We might want experts on medicine and experts on data analysis altogether. Um, also, I think this really illustrates the importance of team science. Not only do we need all of these experts working together, but also that we can keep learning as we do more studies. I think ultimately from a scientific perspective, we're successful if after a series of studies, we understand better what's going on and we can help people more. So it's not a matter of any particular study being right or wrong. It's a matter of over time, do we get closer to the truth? I think this also really highlights the importance of longer range and larger scale experiments. Uh, we see in the job placement example that a really long range experiment over time is not equivalent to a bunch of really small ones. We could do sort of infinitely many small ones, maybe always conclude that there are benefits at eight months and we won't know what happens at 12 or 20. Also, a longer range, larger scale experiment that looks over many cities, as was done in this study, has a lot of benefits relative to many small scale experiments. We could have you know, many experiments where we do randomized controlled trials sort of locally in individual cities or villages, and we might not capture this idea that you know, there's something happening at the expense of other workers more broadly. And this also really ties into incentives and funding. And so if you have a situation where you're funding your grant period or you know, your company's period is always on the element of, or on the order of something like a few years, well, you got to spend a lot of time doing the analysis and writing it up. And so maybe you only have a few months to actually run it. And so you can't learn about things that happen on a longer time scale. Likewise, if uh, the promotion scale that happens at a university or a company is on the order of years or a, a few short years, again, that might really incentivize really sort of more short-term studies um, of just a few months. Okay, so we've talked about just a few things here. Definitely everything we talk about today is not gonna be exhaustive, but hopefully is illustrative of some things that are worth thinking about. Now, going forward, we're going to assume that everyone has agreed on exactly the things we should be measuring, um, that those are totally fine and set. And how could it still be the case that we could have two researchers come to different conclusions? And so next, remember we had our steps. So we said, first we're going to collect our data, then we're gonna turn it into a math problem, then we're gonna run some algorithms and those are gonna be in code. So now we're gonna go down to the code level and we're gonna say, hey, what could, what could potentially be a problem with code? Well, okay, I feel like it's, it's totally plausible at this point that you're saying, ah, boring, I, I know what bugs are. Why are we even talking about bugs? Um, it may be prosaic, but my goodness, does it matter for actual data analysis. So let's again see a couple of examples. Um, very famously, there was an economics paper in the early 2010s that was super widely used to justify austerity policies. So policies really across the world in a variety of countries. And so um, this paper went online, um, it was published. Um, a few years later, a number of other researchers were able to get a hold of the original code for that first paper they found that there was an Excel error. And even though the original paper had meant to be analyzing 20 countries, they, you know, because of this Excel error, were actually only analyzing 15 of the countries. And when this was corrected and a few other errors were corrected, um, the, the actual conclusions of this study did change. And that had major implications. Um, this happens again in other examples like medical examples. So researchers use data analyses 
to decide what treatments to consider <clears throat> to consider in oncology clinical trials. And researchers have found that actually, if you look at some of these data analyses, there have been things as simple as off by one errors, that when you correct them and correct in general what's going on in the analysis, you can get different decisions about whether to treat patients in these cl clinical trials. Okay, so, so bugs do matter. Now, I think another natural question here is, okay, but I use standard packages and standard data analyses, so I don't have to worry about bugs, right? Well, first of all, I can't emphasize enough how much this totally makes sense. Um, again, from a team science perspective, well, of course, we're going to have to outsource some code. Not everybody's going to be able to make all of their own code. For one, uh, you know, if you're going to develop your own new code and statistics and machine learning and so on, to really make that in a meaningful way, you'd probably have to have not only your PhD or, you know, advanced degree in the area that you're interested in, like medicine or econ, but now you got to get a degree in statistics or machine learning or AI too. I mean, you know, that's asking quite a lot. That's already a huge investment of time to do any of these. Um, this code is out there. It's well vetted. It seems like a reasonable thing to do. And the reality is machine learners and statisticians and, you know, AI experts are doing it too. You can't use all, you can't make all of the code, even if that's your area of specialty. That being said, we should still care about that code and to what extent it's vetted, but even more to the point, we should be aware that a lot of code is still ours, even in this context. And so for instance, the issues that are highlighted above are actually pre-processing issues. So let's recall that you know when we're running a data analysis, we're typically writing some of our own code to take the raw data into a form that can be fed into the standard packages. And then once we get something out of the standard packages, we're deciding what to plot, what summaries to show and so on. And so these ends of the analysis can still have bugs and we should be aware of that. And we should be checking for that and we should be doing unit tests to make that as accurate as possible. Another um, sentiment that sometimes arises is to say, well, that scientific area over there has a problem with bugs um, or that scientific area over there has a problem with replicability or any other issue because somebody published something that shows a problem in that area over there. And it's just worth emphasizing that this is definitely a biased sample. Of course, we're gonna find more problems when people check for problems. And so if somebody checked for problems in psychology or in econ or in some other area, well, now we have a sense of what's there. If I have my area, and nobody checks for problems, I should assume that things are at least as bad as in another area, if not worse. Otherwise, it's super easy to disincentivize checking at all. Okay, so what can we do? Well, first of all, surely spreading awareness is a useful thing. We should certainly be aware of it, but it's worth noting that that's not everything. So as early as 2004, people were aware of this issue in Excel, or if you were doing genetics, you'll often have your gene name in a particular um, box in Excel, and Excel will auto-correct that gene name into a date. So for instance, there's a gene name of March 1st, um, and Excel will turn that into you know, some variant of March 1st, like 0301. And so um, a number of researchers in 2016 had the awesome idea of looking at a whole bunch of genetics papers out of that collection of genetics papers, they tried to find how many papers had this Excel error, and they found at least 20% of the papers had this particular known Excel error. And so in the best case, those genes are being actually left out of the analyses where they were meant to be included. Of course, something even worse could be happening. They could be included in some bad way or so on. Okay, so when that originally came out, it was all over the news. Um, I, you know, sort of amazing how much this made it into, you know, just the regular news. Um, people came up with a lot of cool ideas for mitigations for things that could be done here. Um, and, uh, and those have been sort of out there for a number of years. And so uh, around 2021, a number of researchers came back and decided to study this problem again. They said, okay, let's look at new papers, more recent papers and see how many of them have this issue in genetics. And now they found 30% of the papers that they studied had this issue. So let's be clear, 
That doesn't mean it necessarily got worse than it would have been without spreading awareness. So it's totally possible and, and probably the case that if there hadn't been this spreading of awareness, if there hadn't been these mitigations, it would be even worse. You know, it's likely that people were sharing certain types of data and certain types of methodologies that spread this more, um, but it hasn't totally solved the problem either. Another thing that's worth noting is it seems like shaming people isn't very effective. If anything, it's likely to be counterproductive. We want people to share their code for team science, to be able to keep developing on it, to correct it, to figure out if something did go wrong. And I think what happens is when people get shamed for bugs, you get this issue that people worry that their code isn't perfect and they don't share it. Um, uh, it's not perfect. We, we can all agree that all of our code is likely to have bugs at some point that's likely to be imperfect. We should try our best to unit test as much as possible, but it's still gonna be possible that there are bugs. And so better to be sharing it and building on it and recognizing that this just can be an issue. Okay, so what, what can we do? <laughs> Coming back to this question. Um, well, a really basic start, like let's not let perfect be the enemy of the good, is to just have journals require code. So I think it's really awesome that some areas are doing just a really fantastic job of this. I think economics in particular um, is just like amazing uh, as a field for this. Um, other areas definitely have a lot of um, room to grow in this direction, um, but what a, what a fantastic start to go with. Now, of course, it's not everything. Um, so for instance, this economics paper on the previous page um, was published at a journal where code is supposed to be shared. So clearly there needs to be some enforcement mechanism. So that could have been more readily available early on and people could have caught this error more quickly. Um, and of course the ideal would be that people share their code and other people check that that code runs and check that it gives the same results that were expected and so on. Um, and I think we just have to be really cognizant in dealing with this about what are the incentives. So one thing that's just really very much the case is academics are already overwhelmed. They have to do research as a full-time job. They have to teach, which requires a ton of preparation and work. They have to write grants to get funding for all of their work. Um, they have to do service, like organizing meetings and keeping departments running and so on. And any one of these could be a full-time job. And so anything that says, hey, we're going to add like this extra layer of work to academics or anybody who's already very busy without providing some additional incentive, like taking away something else or making it very easy, isn't very realistic. And so for that reason, I think it's very exciting that there are a lot of tools that are being very actively developed to make these things easier, to make them more automatic, to make it possible to really make reproducibility um, an easy, easy check. And so some of these uh, tools are things like supporting the tracking of models and methods. Um, and so one important thing to notice is that if I run a whole bunch of machine learning or statistics methods in a row, and I just report it the one at the end, that's actually potentially quite different than if I had just run the one at the end. And so having the tracking of what I've done already is very important. Knowing what packages I ran is very important. So packages in particular can really change over time and that can make a difference. And so knowing specifically the version can be very important. And again, tracking pipelines. So often, for instance, in genetics, we can have these very complex pipelines with various types of pre-processing software, you know, um, data analysis software and so on. And so it'd be great to track all of that and together with our own um, custom code that we're using locally. And ultimately, hopefully make that in a way that we can just immediately run the analysis and you know, not have to do a lot of extra work. Um, there is still an argument that is sometimes made, especially as we get into modern AI methods that, yeah, but this code for this particular method or experiment is very complex. Does it really need to be shared? In fact, this argument has been made for, um, for instance, a paper in Nature. Um, Nature says that they would like the code to be made available for their analyses, um, but uh, an example paper um, was actually looking at AI for detecting breast cancer um, and was able to not have to provide code or full detail of the method because they argued it was such complex code. And of course, there's nothing specific about this paper. Um, uh, a researcher looked at a whole bunch of methods, AI methods that were designed to diagnose disease um, from images and only 13 out of 62 of them gave code. 
And I hope it's clear that this is potentially problematic. I mean, we've seen already, even in relatively simpler analyses, that things can go wrong with code. I mean, bugs exist. And so I think if anything, going in, we should expect more complex analyses have more potential for bugs. But in either case, we need other groups to be able to check that work and to build on it in order to be able to go forward, do science, check for replicability, and so on. Um, and so certainly, I think, you know, no matter the complexity of the code, it seems like we want something to be shared. Now, sometimes that's going to require some thought, or if we have private data, we're going to have to require some thought, but better to try to deal with those obstacles rather than ignore them. Okay, so now we've talked about the top and the bottom. We said that first, we have to measure something. And going forward, we're just going to assume that we've measured the thing that we care about, because we've already talked about the challenges there. We had to turn that to math. We have to turn that into an algorithm. We have to turn that into code. So now we're going to assume just going forward that our code is perfect. It's great. And so now we're just going to super briefly discuss algorithms. And then we're going to spend a lot of time on turning our analysis into math. OK, I think a really common um, viewpoint at the level of algorithms is, yeah, definitely there's a concern. Are algorithms doing what they purport to do? But isn't this the purview of people working in AI and machine learning and statistics? Isn't this the purview of the data analysts? Aren't they the ones that prove that their algorithm works? If there is an issue, isn't it their problem? Well, the first observation is, well, it's kind of all of our problem if there's an issue, right? Like if we do analyses um, and the algorithms aren't doing what we expect, then we're gonna get potentially bad um, results from those analyses. Um, but I'm also very empathetic to the idea that, again, we're not all going to get PhDs in statistics and machine learning. And so what can we do um, if we're a data analyst or even if we have PhDs in statistics and machine learning, but we're using a method that, you know, we just haven't spent five years digging into, what can we do? Um, so again, just super, super entirely natural to outsource um, some of this development. That being said, I think we can be aware that there can be issues. And so one really simple check, and I think just about anybody can do, is make some simulated data where you think you know the answer and check if the algorithm behaves in the way that you expect. And a big reason for this also is that when statisticians and machine learners provide guarantees, they say, hey, I have an algorithm that does this thing, those guarantees are true under assumption. And I think it's really worth thinking about, do those assumptions apply to any particular problem? Are we close enough to those assumptions that things are still gonna work? Those are some tough questions and reasons to look at things like simulated data to understand what's going on with an algorithm. It's also worth keeping in mind that the most you're gonna get, the type of guarantee you're gonna get from this work is mathematical. Like the guarantee can tell you, hey, if I have a function, I'm going to find the optimum, the minimum of that function. It's not going to tell you, does that mean microcredit helps people? And we're going to see some distinctions in that, some distinctions between perhaps a mathematical um, encapsulation of a problem and what we actually care about really shortly. OK, so at this point, we've talked about three out of four of the steps. We gathered our data. Now we're going to talk about turning high-level goals into math. Once we've done that, we run an algorithm and we have some code. And so for the moment, we're going to assume the algorithm does what the machine learner or statistician thinks it does. It is, is an accurate algorithm for what it purports to do. Our code is perfect. You know, there are no bugs in our code. And we're measuring the thing that we actually care about. And so could it still be the case that two well-meaning researchers could come to different conclusions? If we're good data analysts and we've got bug-free code, and the same data, we're all going to reach the same conclusions, right? Well, uh, scientists actually looked into this. So um, some scientists studied sort of exactly this question by giving 29 different teams the same data analysis question. So they assembled 29 different data science teams. They gave every team the exact same data, so there's no question about what to measure. They've got the data. And they asked the people, the teams, to answer the same question. 
are soccer referees more likely to give red cards to dark skin tone players? And they did not find that the teams all agree. In fact, a very substantial proportion of the teams said yes, and a very substantial proportion of the teams said that there was not a difference. And so remember, in a real life analysis, you're just going to run one analysis. You're just going to get one of these outputs. You're not typically going to assemble your 29 teams. And so here we might have some concern, again, about generalization. Now, this paper is pretty cool. They look not just at, hey, here are these different teams that come to different conclusions. They said, here's some things that I might have thought would predict the difference. Maybe these teams had different prior beliefs about this question, about what they expected from the question, and that really changed the outcome. So these researchers measured that. They measured at least some notion of their prior beliefs, and the researchers at least reported that they found no relationship or that the prior beliefs were not going to just predict the variability that they found here. Um, they also measured the expertise of the teams. You know, going in, maybe some of the teams had more expertise in data science than others. And at least they reported that they did not find that that described the variability, that that predicted the variability that they saw. They also looked at quality of the analyses. Um, so they did a sort of peer review of the different teams to see, you know, were these high quality analyses data analyses that were happening, and they didn't find that the quality of the analyses, at least as they measured it, predicted this variability. Okay, so it seems like it is possible, even when we're measuring the same things, even when we have the exact same data, when it's not obviously that there is some issue with the code, that we could actually reach different conclusions. And so, one of the things we're going to dive into now is what, how that might come about, per, perhaps by formalizing our problem from high-level goals into math on the particular data that we have. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple of examples. Um, a first observation is that it is hard. That we are still at a point it's hard. I think you know, um, hopefully we've already seen it is hard to decide what to measure. There's actually a lot of really careful thought that needs to go into it. Almost everything you measure is going to have some problem. It's not gonna be perfect. And it's just a tough question about, is there anything that's better? And that's also practical. It's hard to get code, to test our code, to make sure it's as bug-free as possible. And I hope that we will appreciate that it is also hard to turn our problem into a mathematical problem, that there are standard tools, but those standard tools don't guarantee that they're doing the right thing always for our problems. Okay, so let's look at a concrete example. Of course, we're interested in things like diagnosing disease. And I think one of the big promises of modern AI methods is that they're really gonna help us do this better, that they're gonna help give us amazing tools to diagnose disease from readily available data. Now, a really common mathematical formalization of this problem, because we'd like to say, yes, diagnose disease well, but we got to turn this into math so we can run an algorithm, is we do the following. First, you know, we collect our data, as we said. And in this case, the data is going to typically be a collection of examples without the disease and a collection of examples with the disease. So for instance, let's say we're trying to diagnose skin cancer from pictures of skin. So we might get pictures of skin and we'll have examples where a doctor and expert has labeled there is no skin cancer and examples where a doctor expert has labeled that there is skin cancer. And we'd like to check that our AI method is gonna do really well. And so typically what will in fact happen is we'll take some proportion of our examples from both sets with and without skin cancer as training data. We'll use that to train the IAI method. And then we'll have some held out data that was not used in training. And we'd like to maximize the correct number of predictions of disease status in that held out data. That's a very typical formalization, the kind of thing that you'll learn in your introductory machine learning or statistics class. Okay, what could possibly go wrong? Well. It could turn out that in fact on the skin pictures, 
that um, the way the skin pictures were collected is they were collected from a doctor's office. And so if the doctor made some ink marks when they thought that there might be skin cancer, then the AI method can maximize the correct predictions of disease on the images of skin by predicting that there is skin cancer when it sees the ink marks. And so it's done a great job on the formalization, on the mathematical formalization, but it hasn't really done what we wanted, which was actually predict skin cancer when a doctor hasn't already done the hard work. Um, another example. Um, so these are this is a real life example. Um, a lot of people uh, towards the beginning of COVID were really interested in using AI to predict whether somebody had COVID. Um, they could look at chest scans, and it turned out that a very popular um, set of data for people who did not have COVID was a set of chest scans of children in the age range of, I believe it was one to five. And so they had their examples of people not having COVID were these children, these examples of people having COVID tended to be adults. And so a really great way for the AI method to make correct predictions is to predict based on whether the person is a child. There are a ton, a ton of examples of this flavor. I mean, I could go on for many, many slides with examples of this flavor. This is a really, really common situation. Um, another related issue that can arise is that a full data set can have duplicates. So here's one way this can arise, is maybe we're interested in predicting a disease and there's one data set of people with and without the disease online. Another set of researchers are sharing another data set of people with and without the disease. Another researcher set of researchers are sharing another data set of people with and without the disease. And some of these data sets might share patients, but then somebody else might come along and combine all of these data sets. And for various reasons, might not remove the duplicates. It might be actually very difficult to do that. And so now, again, if we're just trying to maximize the correct predictions of the disease, well, the AI method can learn to identify the particular patient or scan rather than whether the disease is meaningfully there. Something you'll also sometimes see is people think, hey, you know, I've been told that if I have a lot of data, that I need a lot of data for modern deep learning AI methods to work. And so a great way to get more data is to either replicate the data I have or break up individual data, you know, images that I have. Um, but again, there's this issue that maybe the method is just going to learn the particular patient, the particular scan, rather than something meaningful. Okay, so sort of analogous to the proxies of what we're actually measuring, we now have this issue of mathematical proxies. This particular mathematical objective, it's a convenient proxy for what we actually care about, but it's not exactly the same as diagnosing disease well in future patients. This is also just a brief illustration of why cross-validation isn't a cure-all, um, or things like the bootstrap, general resampling scheme. So what is cross-validation? We have a collection of data, just like before. We have our examples of people with, without cancer and our examples of people with cancer. And so we said that a typical thing is that we'll leave out a chunk of data for testing and train on the rest of the data. Well, in cross-validation, we start by making lots of chunks of our data, maybe 10 chunks of our data. So we have our 10 different chunks. And then what we do is we iteratively go through and leave out each chunk for testing and we train on the rest of the data. And then we leave out the second chunk for testing and train on the rest of the data, the third chunk, and we train on the rest of the data. And so there are some things that cross-validation can be really helpful with, but it's not gonna deal with the issues that we just discussed on this slide. Okay, another really natural question, especially after that last slide, is whether it's these new complex AI methods that are the problem. You know, we mentioned some notion of sort of overfitting to this extra information that we have. Is it just that, you know, when I have these deep learning methods that they can fit on these super tiny little extra things? Is, is this issue of proxies not an issue if we use simpler or vetted methods? And in fact, that is, that is not true, it can still be an issue. Okay, so let's talk about, again, a concrete example. Um, as we said earlier, we might be interested in trying to figure out, is microcredit helping people? And say we decided to measure business profit, we still have to say, okay, what's the mathematical formalization of what it means to be helping? One common formalization, extremely common, is to say, we're gonna take the people who did not receive microcredit, we're gonna take the empirical average, the mean, of their business profit, 
We're going to take the people who did receive microcredit. We're going to take the empirical average, the mean of their business profit, and we'll compare these values. If the business profit is higher on average for people who did receive microcredit, then we'll say that microcredit is helping. Okay, well, just to see what could potentially be an issue here, let's imagine a cartoon world where it turns out absolutely nobody benefits from microcredit. So in this cartoon world, nobody benefits from microcredit except for a super tiny handful of people. Well, the nature of the empirical average is that if it benefits those tiny handful of people a lot, the empirical average could still be much higher for the people with microcredit. In fact, the empirical average is such that if microcredit hurts a lot of people, in fact, if maybe it could hurt almost everybody, except for this tiny handful, and it hurt, if it helps this tiny handful enough, still the empirical average will be higher. And so it's possible to conclude it helps even if most people it's hurting. Now, I'm not saying that's happening in practice, but this is one potential issue with an empirical average that we would want to be aware of. And in fact, it's a real concern in actual economics. Um, so if, for instance, we look at the United States um, and we look at something like the household net worth as reported by the Federal Reserve Board, the mean household net worth in the United States is around a million and the median is around 200,000. And this is just to illustrate that the mean can be really, really different from the median just due to a few small outliers. In fact, that's what's happening here. There's just a few, a very small proportion of very, very wealthy people in the United States. Now, here we're talking about this comparison of empirical averages. This is actually just a special case of a linear model. And linear models together with ordinary least squares are just incredibly standard in many areas of science and social science. Um, and I wanna emphasize that that really makes a lot of sense. There are reasons for this. Um, unlike just about everything else you can do in data analysis, linear models give you a closed form unique solution in you know, any case that isn't like especially problematic. Uh, but the vast majority of the time, they give you a closed form unique solution. Um, and that's great. It's something that is much more easy to understand. The code as a result is extremely easy to check. You can have extremely well-vetted code that everybody's using also, so that's very well checked. Um, the theory is, I, there's probably you know, no model with more theory and more understanding than these models. So it makes a lot of sense to use them in some ways, but at the same time, they can be reporting something that is a proxy for what we really care about. And as we said before, sometimes that's fine, and sometimes that really matters. Now, a lot of people are aware of this issue, that a few extreme points can really change what's effectively a, a mean here. Um, you know, Even if we really, really wanted to be measuring something like, is microcredit helping the vast majority of people a substantive amount, um, you know, people might think, hey, maybe I could use a linear model, but just remove the outliers. And it's worth noting that removing outliers as sort of an automatic thing just isn't a cure-all, and it's something we should be really careful about. So a famous historical example of this is um, when ozone depletioning, depletion was originally happening. Um, this is around the, the 80s and 90s. Um, NASA actually had a bunch of um, sensors that could detect this. And at first, it was so massive, the change was so different, that, it was, that those differences were flagged as outliers to NASA. Um, so they sort of had a internal flagging process for any observations that were just really unusual. Um, luckily, those were eventually checked. People realized that this was actually an indicator that you know something was going on in the ozone. Um, but if we just threw away outliers, we could throw away really important points. And this is sort of a general observation as well. You know, if you have outliers in medicine, we really want to know what's going on with those people. You know, maybe there are certain subsets of people who shouldn't get a particular intervention, like a drug. Or maybe there are subsets of people who really, really, really benefit from a drug, and we should know that and maybe target something to them. In general, it's really worth investigating those outliers. Okay, one last point, and then we'll, we'll start moving on to mitigations. Um, okay, well, this is all well and good, but thankfully there are p-values, right? So if I have p-values, those will tell me if my results is right, if it's generalizable. Well, in fact, that's not the case. So let's just recall what is a p-value. So very roughly, 
a p-value is just basically a probability, a probability of how likely, or a probability that's telling us how likely our data, or more particularly a summary of our data, is under one particular model. And the rough idea is that if it's very unlikely, we'll reject that model. Now that model is pretty much always a proxy for what's actually going on. You know, we know that no particular model is correct. So this is a very famous adage attributed to George Box, but also just, you know, generally um, very much repeated since that time. And so that model is really often just meant to stand in for like, we think that there's no effect of something. Um, we think that, you know, for instance, microcredit isn't having an effect or some medical intervention isn't having an effect. Um, but the reality is it's just one particular model. It's a model that's definitely wrong. And so because it's wrong, we generally expect that if we were to get enough data, like a really, really large amount of data, that the p-value is going to get really small. That is to say, we're going to reject the model where nothing's going on. But that's not necessarily meaningful. It's something that's just going to happen because we get enough data. And of course, by the way, this was originally very well known to the creators of p-values. They just meant to be this as you know a nice check among many checks, um, a nice way to think about things, not necessarily sort of a rubber stamp on science. OK, so what can we do? Well, um, a really awesome statistician, Vin Yu, advocates for the importance of stability. She actually just has a, a new book out on this as well. Um, the idea that basically, you know, if we uh, change little things about the analysis, we shouldn't change the substantive conclusions. And we'd be concerned if it were the case that if we change things that we think shouldn't matter, that the substantive conclusions would change. And of course, researchers are intuitively really aware of this. So in the case of microcredit, people run not just a single randomized controlled trial in one place at one time. They run multiple randomized controlled trials in different countries by different researchers. Like anything, it's not a silver bullet, it's not a panacea, but it's a good idea. It's a good thing to check. Um, in general, this is really, you know, it really points out the importance of incentivizing follow-up work and replication, um, having different groups with different perspectives, try out different things, um, making sure that they are coming to the same conclusions. And if they're not, getting to the, you know, basis of what is going on there, um, that this should be something that is really rewarded scientifically. Of course, an issue that I think we all face is it's not always feasible, at least initially, to convene multiple teams. If there's something we really, really care about, hopefully we'll do these much larger scale trials. Hopefully we'll do things where we really um, have replicates that people try things out. Um, but sometimes we're just one particular team. We want to come to our conclusions. We want to you know, see what's going on. We want to make them as generalizable as possible. And so what can we do as one team before we share our ideas with the world? And so I'll talk about two really, really high level but super important ideas here. And then we'll go on um, and finish up with this stability check that we talked about earlier. OK, so the first of the two super important ideas is explainability as a form of stability. I can't possibly do this justice. There is just a whole field now on explainable AI and explainable machine learning. Um, but basically, a rough idea here is, you know, if I was looking at these pictures of skin, and I could say why I chose, I, you know, my, my algorithm labeled particular pi pictures to have cancer or not, and it was that there were these ink markings, then I could be like, oh, you know, clearly it's learning about the ink markings. That's actually not really meaningful. And so I don't think that that's a really important thing that's going to generalize to other data sets where those ink markings are not. Whereas if my algorithm, you know, if I knew from my algorithm that the way it was choosing, the way it was making labels of skin and saying whether there was cancer, if that was based on something about the skin itself, especially something that we had some reason medically to expect had something to do with skin cancer, we might think, ah, yes, that seems much more like it's getting at the actual goal of medical diagnostics, of, um, of you know, medical diagnosis. Uh, and so that would be something that we might trust a lot more to generalize. Another just incredible best practice in absolutely everything we do is visualizing and investigating the data. So visualizing, and this all sort of relates to explainability on some level, with visualizing, we just want to see what's going on in the data. You know, if we have an economic intervention, and we're concerned that we're just taking the mean of something like business profit or you know some other thing we're measuring in two groups. Well, we could check. We could actually you know we could draw 
those data points and we could see, is it the case that in one group, the data points are systematically higher than the other group? Or is it the case that actually there's just a few outliers and you know they're really out there? Especially as we get into higher dimensions of data, this becomes more challenging, but also it becomes in some sense more important because it's not just so obvious what exactly are the outliers, um, especially not in just a single dimension. Also investigating the data. So if we do in fact have some outliers or some weird data points or some data points that really seem like they're meaningful, like they're doing, they're driving the data analysis, like let's find out what those data points are. Um, so for instance, in the case of the, uh, the NASA data that we talked about with looking at the ozone depletion, you know, if we can investigate these outliers and understand them, and in fact, you know, this is what people did, um, then we might be able to see, oh, actually this, the ozone is just surprisingly depleted in ways that weren't expected. Um, if we have a medical intervention and some people are performing in a way that wasn't expected or, you know, we're visualizing the data and we see data points that are worth investigating, we might find subgroups that are just really getting a different experience of a drug. Um, and that is worth understanding why that's happening. Sometimes in investigating our data, we might find some of it's just corrupted, um, but then we know, we know why we're seeing weird things. Okay, so all of this is still challenging. It's challenging to actually explain what's going on in data. Sometimes it's challenging, and especially when we have data in more than one dimension, to visualize our data. And it's challenging to know what data points to investigate. You know, what are data points that are worth following up on, especially if they're not just, you know, outliers in just a single direction. And indeed, there are cases where we can have data, but there's questions about the data, and there aren't just obvious outliers in any one dimension. And so what can we do in these cases? And this is where I'm gonna conclude by talking about some of our own research. Could we have something that helps the user have something that's a little bit automated to check for stability that helps guide them in what they might visualize, what they might investigate? And so this is again, coming from this perspective of we might worry about this notion of stability. We might worry about generalizing our generalization of our particular data analysis conclusions, if it turned out we could drop a super tiny fraction of data and change our substantive conclusions. And again, I think we have quite a lot of intuition about this already. Um, in fact, we find in a real life study, a randomized controlled trial of microcredit with over 16,500 data points, that we can drop one data point and change the conclusion between microcredit helping and microcredit hurting people, here it's based on the sign of an effect for millennial regression. Now, if you run data analyses, if you're familiar with data analyses, you're probably thinking, yeah, but you know, people aren't going to invest in microcredit unless they get a statistically significant positive effect. So usually when people are looking at studies um, and they're trying to make decisions based on those studies, they're looking for a statistically significant effect of a particular type. And so I think even more compelling is that actually we find that we can drop 15 data points and get a statistically significant effect of the opposite sign. This is just 0.1% of the entire data set. It's an extremely small fraction. And it seems like we might worry that it seems like the conclusions of the original analysis really hinge on this super tiny fraction that we don't know is going to exist in a future data set, in a future analysis. And that's why we might care about generalization. Okay, so what we'd like to do at a high level is check if I have a new analysis, does this super tiny fraction of data exist that I could, does, it, does there exist a super tiny fraction of data that if I dropped it could change conclusions? If it does, I might worry. If it doesn't, you know, maybe at least I'm not worried about this particular thing. And the challenge, the reason that there has to be methodology, the reason that computer scientists and statisticians might care about this problem is it's just way too costly to check every data subset. If I tried removing every 15 data points for my analysis, um, every small 0.1% of data subsets for my analysis and re-ran my data analysis every time, it would take something like over 10 to the 44 years to check this data analysis. Um, I could be an economist running on, you know, 16,000 data points isn't incredibly large. It's a reasonably, it's, it's a lot of work to gather that data set, but it's not as big as some data sets that exist out there. And yet I could still have all the compute power of Amazon and Facebook and Google and not be able to run this simple check. And so because that's so expensive, 
We need an approximation. And so that's where our research comes in. We show that we can use an approximation, that it's fast, it's easy to use and accurate. And what I mean by that is fast. It takes just seconds to run on the data analysis above. And in general, it's linear time for the data we have, or at most um, logarithmic or n log n. Um, it's easy to use. There's no need for the user to derive equations or understand some complex math that's going on behind the scenes. Um, they just have to provide the sort of things they would provide already for their analysis. And it's accurate. So what do I mean by accuracy? On one hand, we have theory to show that the approximation works well. But as I've already mentioned, every type of theory that you see in machine learning and statistics has assumptions. And so I think most importantly, the user doesn't have to interrogate those assumptions. They don't have to be familiar with the theory. We're going to tell them as part of our algorithm the points that are problematic. And so the user can drop those points from their analysis, rerun that analysis with those points dropped, and see if there was, in fact, a change. And if there was a change, it can only be at least that bad. So for instance, in the example above, we did check that we can actually drop these 15 data points, and we can, in fact, get a statistically significant effect of the opposite sign. So things can only be more non-robust than what we've reported. And finally, I just want to mention before we dig into some real data analyses, that any useful data analysis has to be sensitive to some change. If I had a data analysis that no matter how much data I removed or how much I changed my data, I would always get the same answer. It just gives me the same number every time. That's not a data analysis. It's just you know, something that returns um, a value no matter what you do. And so here, we're only concerned. We only want to really investigate what's going on if we could drop a super tiny fraction of data and change our conclusions. If we have to drop a lot of data to change our conclusions, we're not so concerned. OK, so we're going to look at a bunch of real data analyses to understand what this type of non-robustness means and how it's not the same thing as other common tools. So for instance, the first thing we're going to look at is that it's not showing the exact same thing as statistical significance. Um, very famously, there was a lottery in Oregon and the USA where the winners could sign up for a form of health care. It's Medicaid. Um, Finkelstein et al. 2012, super cool paper. They recognize this as a natural experiment, um, and they wanted to say, hey, can we see if signing up for Medicaid, well, with winning the lottery, or if signing up for Medicaid in particular, is actually improving people's health? And so they gathered data from 21,000 um, data points. These are survey responders. So we do have these issues of, you know, is there a survey non-response bias? Who's getting measured? Um, but, you know, you got to do something. They looked at so many different things in this paper. And we looked at you know, many of their analyses. Again, you can check it out um, in our paper, which I'll link to at the end. Um, I'm just going to talk about one at this moment, but like definitely read the actual paper. There's so much going on there. It's very cool. One of the things they found was a statistically significant result. So the p-value was less than 0.01 for a positive effect of winning the lottery on health. Now, again, there's this tough question of what is health? In this particular case, they looked at, I believe it was a month about a year beyond the lottery. And they asked in that month, what was the number of days of no impaired activity? These are tough questions about how to measure health. This is just one particular way to do it. Um, we find in this particular case for this, this one particular experiment that we can drop 10 data points and change the statistical significance. And now it's worth noting, this is not 5% of the data. It's not 0.5% of the data, it's 0.05% of the data. It's an extremely small fraction of the data um, is driving this conclusion. And so it's worth understanding that and thinking about that for generalization. Um, another natural thing to think is, well, maybe we can avoid instability of this form, non-robustness of this form, by using Bayesian methods or by using really complex models. Um, we've got all these modern methods that are much more complex. Um, you know, we've talked a few times about linear models, um, but we're going to see that's not going to be a cure-all either. So our collaborator, Rachel Meager, so she's on both of the papers that I'm talking about today. She does super cool work. She's definitely our microcredit expert. If I have misrepresented anything about microcredit, it's totally my bad. She's really the expert. Um, and she's done a Bayesian analysis of actually all seven very famous randomized controlled trials of microcredit. So one thing that's really cool about Bayesian inference is it's widely used 
to share power across different studies. And so this seems like a perfect use of it here. Um, she is an expert in both Bayesian inference and economics. So she could super carefully choose her models. She doesn't have to just rely on a standard method um, and have it be a poor match for what she's doing. She can spend a lot of time on this and she did that. And yet there is still non-robustness. And so we find um, in her analysis that we can drop less than 0.03% of the data to change a Bayesian version, version of statistical significance. And we can drop less than 0.1% of the data to change the sign of the effect. Again, the difference between microcredit helping and hurting. Another observation is it's not just that everything is non-robust. We might be concerned about a type of non-robustness that just says all data analysis is bad. Let's throw up our hands. Um, in fact, we have a couple of pieces of evidence here. So one, our theory shows that what this is really reflecting, whether I can drop a super tiny fraction of data is a signal to noise ratio in the data. So if I have a very high signal to noise ratio, then I can't find a super tiny fraction of data to drop to change my conclusions. If I have a very low signal to noise, I can. So for instance, if I have data that looks like it's just, you know, it's on a line, you, you, if you draw the line, nobody's gonna debate you what the slope of that line is, what the sign of its slope is. Everybody's gonna agree there's not gonna be an issue of dropping data robustness. If I just have a big old blob of data, which is surprisingly often the case in practice, um, that's going to be a case where I have a very low signal to noise, and it's going to be easy to drop a small fraction of data and change conclusions. Okay, that being said, let's talk about a concrete example. So there's this very cool paper by Angelou Change in Georgia 2009. It looks at a couple of things. So first, it looks at the effect of cash transfers now on food consumption in poor households. They have over 10,000 data points, and we just find that we have to drop a ton of data to change conclusions. We tried dropping, or we tried changing the sign the significance, the sign and the significance. In all of these cases, we had to drop something like 4% of the data or 10% of the data. It was just a, a ton of the data. And so we definitely don't find that we can drop a super tiny fraction of data and change conclusions here. This seems um, like we can't conclude non-robustness. Now, on the other hand, you know, we had talked earlier about maybe we could just remove outliers. And um, sometimes there's this feeling of like maybe an automatic thing that people should do for robustification in their procedures is remove outliers. We already talked about how we should probably look into those outliers a bit. Um, but even when we remove outliers, that's not the same thing as getting rid of non-robustness here. So Angela Chiu in DeGiorgi 2009, the exact same paper actually looks at a second thing as well. They say, hey, if I have a randomized controlled trial and people and, and the researchers give microcredit, or sorry, give cash transfers to the poor individuals in a village, do the non-poor individuals also benefit from a spillover effect? And so the original analysis does a sort of classic robustification procedure. They remove the largest responses. Um, those are a form of outlier. And we find that still, even after that, we can drop three data points out of over 4,000 and change the statistical significance. Um, finally, I'll just mention um, a concern sometimes in science um, is this notion of p-hacking. And so, for instance, somebody might run a whole bunch of analyses, um, and they might just report the one with the lowest, the best p-value. Um, and so you might be concerned about p-hacking in this case. Um, Michael, this guy who is not a super cool guy, um, has a, a blog post up um, about how if you look at a p-hacked analysis where he, know he, he knows it's p-hacked in advance, then um, this method, uh, this dropping a small fraction of data will flag that it's possible to drop a small fraction of data. And my um, uh, former PhD student and postdoc, now a professor at UC Berkeley, Ryan Giordano, has a blog post following this up um, about what is going on here. Okay, so finally, to conclude. Today we talked about a bunch of challenges at different levels of a data analysis. Um, in particular, we started by laying out, you know, just that there are these levels, that we got to collect data, that that's a really, really hard problem, um, that we've got to turn that into a mathematical problem. That's a hard problem too, that we've got to solve that mathematical problem with algorithms, and we've got to instantiate that with code. Um, man, I hope if people, you know, take one thing away from just that, um, that, that set of four steps is that, you know, this really is a, a challenging endeavor 
to do data science. It's not just something that's a, a cookie cutter endeavor. And these challenges really illustrated that even if everybody is well-meaning, even if nobody has corrupted your data, even if you haven't corrupted your data yourself, um, that still we can have these issues of disagreement. And a lot of them boil down to the fact that we are often using proxies for what we really care about in measurement. And we're often using proxies for what we really care about in deciding what counts as helping. Um, that you know we have code and code is imperfect. Um, and these are real challenges we have to deal with. So we've talked today about these challenges. I think it is worthwhile to be aware of them, but I also think there's really exciting work going on in many research fields to mitigate exactly these challenges. Um, and it's really exciting that that's happening. If you're interested to learn more, we have a science advances paper um, that came out in 2023 that goes over a lot of the things I've talked about today. I'm also going to link um, to my set of slides and I'm going to link to all of the um, papers and so on that I've talked about all of the, um, uh, the, the references. Um, so you can check those out as well. And then at the end of today's talk, I talked about this one particular check that is hopefully helpful among many, a way to check if there exists a very small fraction of the data that if you dropped it could change your substantive conclusions. Um, so this work is up on the archive. Um, uh, again, awesome work by uh, my former PhD student and postdoc, Ryan Giordano, and our amazing economics expert and collaborator, Rachel Meager, who are serving as effectively co-first authors on this paper. Um, Ryan Giordano's code is up at the following GitHub repository. You can check it out. Um, or the code for this is up at Ryan Giordano's GitHub repository. You can check it out. Um, and uh, you can see that this is not, this work is very much not specific to um, economics. You know, we looked at economics because we had this amazing collaborator in Rachel Meeker. And again, there's this bias that because economics is such an awesome field in terms of reproducibility, in terms of having its code out there and its data out there and being able to recreate everything, we were able to do it so easily um, that that's a really natural focus. But of course we expect this more generally. So we've done some work um, starting to look at things like biology and that's up in the archive now too, with the first author being my um, PhD student who recently graduated, Miriam Schiffman. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs>